If you keep reptiles, you've probably heard some myths that have absolutely no basis in fact. I'm sure you've recognized some of these, but others seem reasonable until you realize that they aren't. I put out a post asking for submissions of some reptile misconceptions and myths that people have heard, and I received over 200 responses. My name is Hunter Hauk, and in today's video, I'll be debunking some ridiculous myths surrounding reptile care. One of these is a write-up of a study that was done on turtles to see if they actually do absorb water through their cloacas, and I don't know where this idea started. I think it was frankly born of ignorance, but regardless, we need to end it. This video is gonna make some people mad, but it's absolutely worth it. Every single day, I hear people regurgitating ridiculous, old, out-of-date information, and it's time to put a stop to that. You've probably heard the common ones like, sand will kill your reptiles, and superworms will eat your reptiles' stomachs from the inside out, and leopard geckos don't climb. And I'm sure you know, if you're watching this, that those are ridiculous and false, but there are some that are just as common that a lot of people don't recognize to be untrue. In today's video, I'm going to be deep diving and disproving some of these myths that are often regarded as true or not given a second thought that are absolutely false. I decided to reach out to a large group of reptile keepers dedicated to advancing the standard of reptile care, the Advancing Herpetological Husbandry Facebook group, which is one of the only reptile care Facebook groups that isn't an absolute echo chamber of misinformation. I made a post asking people to share some common misconceptions that they'd heard, expecting to get about a dozen responses. But within 12 hours, I had heard from over 200 reptile keepers. I want to thoroughly cover this topic, so I'm only going to be able to cover a handful of topics in this particular video, but if you do all enjoy it and want me to, I'd be happy to make this a series. In this video, I'll be referencing a lot of studies, articles, websites, and essays, and all of those will be linked in the sources link that's in the description so that you can access them easily if you want to read more into them. Without further ado, let's debunk some lies that are floating around the reptile hobby. The first misconception that we're going to be deep diving into is that Ball pythons don't need large enclosures because they live in termite mounds in the wild. This is such a commonly spread myth throughout the hobby, and it's absolutely ridiculous. I'm using ball pythons as my example, but people say similar things about east indigo snakes, bull snakes, gopher snakes, and other snakes that spend time underground. First, we need to understand where ball pythons are actually found in nature. To do this, I wanted to go onto the iNaturalist website, which is an online resource where anyone can look at and record observations of a plant and animal species that they see in the wild. As you can see, bull pythons spend a lot of their time in open areas. That's where they're commonly observed. This one was even comfortable enough to lay her eggs out in the middle of like an open space. Now, we can't completely dismiss the idea that ball pythons spend a fair amount of time in termite mounds. This study found that ball pythons in the wild do spend most of their days in enclosed spaces such as termite mounds, but just as much of their time, especially for the males, is spent at night climbing trees. So the next time anyone tells you that ball pythons don't climb, send them this study. This study is actually super interesting. It shows that a lot of common captive bull python care is completely wrong. Not only do bull pythons climb trees a lot, they also eat primarily birds in the wild, especially males. It's really interesting reading into this just to see how much of the common care information surrounding these awesome snakes is wrong. That's not the topic at hand though. What did we learn from this? We learned that just because bull pythons spend a lot of their daytime, when they're asleep in the wild, in termite mounds, they spend just as much time in the trees and out climbing around during the night, so there's really no excuse for not giving them enclosures in captivity that allow them to replicate that behavior. This whole myth is kind of propagated by the whole commercial ball python breeding side of the hobby that I try not to involve myself in very much because they want to make as much money as possible, and they don't care if it means sacrificing the quality of life for their animals, but we have to look at the science that says that bull pythons need large 
spaces because they use large spaces in the wild. This could really bring us down a rabbit hole of reptile keeping ethics, and that's actually a future video that I'm planning, so if you want to see that, be sure to subscribe. This next misconception is that reptiles that are commonly referred to as terrestrial don't climb at all. If I had a dollar for every time someone told me leopard geckos, or hog noses, or corn snakes, or ball pythons, or bearded dragons, or I could keep going on with this list for a long time, don't climb, I could probably buy myself an even nicer camera or something. Now, I feel like it's pretty common knowledge that this is not true, but about a dozen people wanted me to talk about it, so I'm gonna talk about it briefly. I can't think of a single species of reptile that lacks the physical ability to do at least a little bit of climbing. Not all reptiles are gonna climb, like crested geckos, for example, because not all of them are arboreal, but any reptile, especially in captivity, that's given the option to climb to a higher space is going to try it, at least try their best, to do some climbing. In my opinion, the goal of any reptile enclosure should be to provide as many opportunities to exhibit and replicate natural behaviors as possible. Otherwise, what's the point of having reptiles? Climbing is one of those behaviors that we need to encourage and provide the opportunity for them to do. Again, I believe this myth too was started because of the commercialization of the reptile keeping industry. Big breeders tell people that they need smaller enclosures so that people will put their animals in smaller enclosures so they'll have more space in their homes to buy more enclosures so that they can buy more reptiles, which in turn makes the breeders more money. See where all of this lies, we really need to get away from giving all our money to big breeders and supporting small breeders. But again, my reptile keeping ethics video that's coming up in whenever I get it done, it's a whole process, <laughs> we'll be talking about that more. This next misconception is about humidity and hydration because it's one that I feel like we really don't understand as a reptile keeping hobby. Many people have this fear that providing any humidity is gonna kill their reptiles that are considered traditionally as arid species in the hobby. They refuse to give water bowls to their rosy boas or bearded dragons or leopard geckos because they're like, I don't want them to get a respiratory infection, but really dehydration is a much bigger problem. I don't know where this idea started. I think it was frankly born of ignorance, but regardless, we need to end it. In the natural habitats of all the species that I previously mentioned, rosy boas, leopard geckos, and bearded dragons, they have access to areas with higher humidity. Let's hop back onto our favorite website, iNaturalist, and look at where people have reported seeing Pagona viticeps or the central bearded dragon. Each of the orange marks on the map is an observation that someone has marked on iNaturalist. They're very well spread out across most of Australia, but you'll see that the highest concentration of iNaturalist observations for bearded dragons is in northwest Victoria. Now, I am not familiar with Australia at all, so I'm not claiming to be an expert, this is just an example, but there are two reasons why there could be a higher number of observations here than in other places. One, maybe there's more people there, or two, maybe there's more bearded dragons there. Those are the two major possibilities, I'm just not sure. It's not important because this is just an example. Now let's look at the humidity in Victoria. As you can see from the graphic on the screen right now, there are months where the average humidity goes up to 75%. I promise giving your bearded dragon or leopard gecko or rosy boa or almost any other reptile a water bowl is not gonna kill it. Thank you. I don't want this video to just be me talking to you, but rather with you, so let's take advantage of the comment section. Is there a point that I've made so far that you've really agreed with, or that's like blown your mind, or that you're like, Hunter, that was actually kind of stupid and you're wrong because blank. Let me know in the comments down below because I love having conversations with you guys, especially on videos like this where we're all sharing information. I make a point to reply to every single comment, so I would really love to hear from you. This video has also taken a long time for me to write and then to record, and I know it's gonna take me a long time to edit, so if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button, I would really appreciate it. Another misconception that is unfortunately common in the reptile hobby is that content creators get a big audience because they know what they're talking about. There are some reptile keepers and content creators who have a large audience and a large platform, and it seems pretty reasonable that because of this large platform, it would mean that they're a good source of information, right? This is a problem. Many of these large reptile content creators and keepers who people listen to, or at least follow on social media, 
have large audiences not because the information that they provide is correct or even good, but rather because they know how to work the algorithm of YouTube or Instagram or TikTok or whatever platform it is that they have that large audience on. I think we all know exactly who I'm talking about. No, I'm totally kidding. There are like four people off the top of my head that I'm like, these four people especially really know how to work the algorithm, but the information that they provide is crazy. But I'm not gonna say who they are because I don't wanna get into a fight with anyone today. It's important that we start uplifting the voices of reptile content creators who actually research in depth what they are talking about instead of those who spend 10 minutes Googling before they make their 10 minute YouTube video or 10 second TikTok. Additionally, a lot of big breeders, they know how to get these animals to reproduce in captivity so that they can make more money, but they don't know how to keep them in a naturalistic manner because they've never tried. How can they be saying that big enclosures are gonna stress their reptiles out when they've never tried offering them? The logic, I just can't find it. To conclude this point, be careful where you're getting your information from. Reach out to people who are going above and beyond to get information, and don't just think that someone knows what they're talking about because they have a large platform. Misconception number five is one that has, like I heard it when I first started keeping reptiles and I'm like, this is really weird and I don't think it's true, but I never actually did research on it until I was preparing this video because it's another one that I got probably a dozen people wanting me to talk about. This is the idea that you should soak your reptiles because they drink through their cloacas. I know, a lot of you are like, where is this coming from? But I promise, in most bearded dragon groups, you'll hear people saying that and it's absolutely ridiculous. I went over to Google Scholar and typed in so many variations of cloacal drinking that my internet service provider probably thinks I'm a really weird person. No, I'm totally kidding, but yeah, I didn't find any scholarly articles on this except for two. One of these is a write-up of a study that was done on turtles to see if they actually do absorb water through their cloacas, and they tested it. The study's name is on screen right now, and it says, and I quote, dehydrated turtles with tail and anus submerged showed no changes in mass or osmolality, suggesting that water absorption is not a significant function of the cloacal bursae in this species. And it was pond sliders that they tested it on. The idea of cloacal drinking is also referred to in a paper called Critical Care Nutrition and Fluid Therapy in Reptiles by Dr. Paul M. Gibbons, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine. He writes, and I quote, there is no evidence to support the hypothesis that reptiles might drink via the cloaca, though some authors have misreported the results of studies on the hypothesis. Basically what he's saying is there have been some studies that set out to see whether or not they did this and the hypothesis was that yes, they did, but what they found was that no, they do not absorb water through their cloacas, and a lot of people are just regurgitating the hypothesis without actually reading the study. Basically, every time someone recommends that someone soak their reptile because they will stop being dehydrated because they drink through their cloaca, you're just helping spread a myth that has absolutely no basis in fact. Unless that changes and there becomes some scientific evidence to support that, let's stop spreading that false theory. Thank you. Thank you so much for sticking with me through this long video where I debunked some of the most common and most frustrating reptile care myths that we hear a lot in this hobby. Is there one that stood out to you in particular? Leave a comment down below. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button so that more people can see it. And if you wanna see more videos where I talk all about reptiles and amphibians, be sure to subscribe to my channel. If you wanna support my channel and get awesome perks for as little as $1 a month, definitely join my Patreon or you can get some awesome merch at Shop Hunter Hauk. The link to both of those things is in the description of this video. Once again, thank you so much for watching. My name is Hunter Hauk, and I hope to see you in my next video.